Okay, so we've covered non-pregnant vaginal bleeding. Let's talk about vaginal bleeding in pregnancy. So this is a first trimester ultrasound, and you can see the first finding in pregnancy is a gestational sac. Um, and that can be seen at four to five weeks on a transvaginal ultrasound and about a week later on a transabdominal ultrasound. But in order to have a definitive IUP, you need a yolk sac inside the gestational sac. And that's going to be seen at five, five and a half weeks on transi uh, transvaginal ultrasound and about a week later again on a transabdominal ultrasound. So that's the one that can exclude an topic as a, a definitive IUP. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about miscarriages, right? So you can have a threatened abortion, you can have an inevitable or incomplete. So the difference between threatened and inevitable is really whether the os is open or closed. Um, both can have bleeding, um, threatened can have pain, you know, this would be less than 20 weeks. And in if they have a threatened uh, abortion, you just want to make sure that you recommend vaginal rest. Um, it's okay for them to do normal activities. Inevitable, well, there's not that much that you can do when the os is opened, and so it's important to get gyne involved. They may take patients for DNC. So incomplete abortion, so this is uh, already undergoing the process, so you can have bleeding, you can see tissue at the os. Um, they may have retained products of conception, so it's important to get an ultrasound to assess for that. And then your options here are DNC or expectant management. Here's an overview of ectopic pregnancy. So remember risk factors. Uh, PID is a big one. Previous ectopic, of course. If you've had tubal ligation or pelvic surgery, that increases your risk. But half of these patients will have no risk factors. So this typically occurs five to eight weeks after the last known menstrual period with pain and sometimes bleeding. Uh, you may have relative bradycardia. This is thought to be due to excessive vagal tone. Um, the most common location is a distal fallopian ectopic. Okay, so if you have an ultrasound with a double gestational sac, a yolk sac, or fetal pole, or fetal heart activity, that shows you that you have an IUP. And in general, excludes ectopic pregnancy, although you can have heterotopic pregnancy in the case of fertility treatments. We'll talk about that. The HCG rise with an ectopic pregnancy is slower than the expected increase in HCG in, a, in an intrauterine pregnancy. And the level correlated with the ultrasound results improves the predictive value of both tests. So let's talk a little bit about ectopic pregnancy. So transvaginal ultrasound um, is your imaging modality of choice, and it's diagnostic in about 80% of stable patients. So it's important to know about the sonographic uh, discriminatory zone. And so this is the level of HCG that corresponds to a developing IUP. So on transvaginal, this is about 1,500 to 3,000, and that's when you should see a gestational sac. Transabdominal is higher at 6,000. So remember, um, you know, if you're worried about an ectopic pregnancy, it doesn't really matter what the HCG is. Um, you know, even if it's below the discriminatory zone, you're still going to get the ultrasound to take a look for it. So if there's an IUP on the ultrasound, there's a high probability that it is not an ectopic. As Aaron had mentioned, um, you know, the, the exclusion here is if they are on fertility medication. And so it's really important to ask these patients because they are at risk for heterotopic pregnancies. And that could be a pregnancy inside the uterus, but also outside of the uterus. So um, what's diagnostic for an ectopic? If you have an empty uterus, um, but you have embryonic cardiac activity outside of the uterus. And again, if you have an empty uterus, but the beta HCG is greater than 1500, right? So you hit that discriminatory zone, but you don't see anything inside, this should raise your suspicion for an ectopic. If you can feel an adnexal mass, if you see free fluid on the ultrasound, um, then that's concerning. So if it's indeterminate, right, so if there's no definitive IUP or an ectopic, um, these patients may be, you know, depending on how high risk or how high the suspicion, you can get gyne involved. Um, you know, if the HCG is lower, then these patients may be appropriate for serial HCGs, repeat in 48 hours and following up with their gynecologist. And this picture here is just showing you an example of this heterotopic pregnancy with a pregnancy um, inside the uterus as well as outside the uterus. So how are you going to treat these patients? Well, you can certainly treat them surgically, right? You can excise the ectopic pregnancy if necessary. Some of these patients may end up with um, a salpingostomy. And if they're unstable, they certainly will go to the OR. If it's early enough, you can potentially treat these medically with methotrexate, and this will inhibit cell division. There are certain criteria that make you eligible for treatment with methotrexate. For instance, the tubal mass has to be less than four centimeters, and no cardiac activity has to be present. Thank you.
Um, with methotrexate, abdominal pain is the most common side effect. And, um, you know, I think typically in these situations, it's usually GYN who's going to be writing for this. And it's important to remember and also to counsel patients that about a third can have a failure with uh, methotrexate alone and may end up needing surgical intervention anyway. What about IgG anti-D antibodies? So there's a large number of trade names that produce these, and these destroy Rh-positive fetal red cells in the maternal circulation. So the problem here is if you have an Rh-negative mother uh, and the mother develops antibodies to Rh-positive fetal blood that cross the placenta, they can cause a hemolytic anemia syndrome in the fetus, splenomegaly, erythroblastosis, and death. So when do you give this? If you have an Rh-negative mom and an abortion of any type, if you have Rh-negative mom with abruption, ectopic, antipartum hemorrhage, uh, even relatively minor trauma, these should be given. Okay, now what about a placental abruption? So we talked about this previously. This is separation of the placenta from the uterine wall. It can be spontaneous, um, but you certainly can be seen in the setting of abdominal trauma. So what puts patients at risk for this? Well, being older, hypertension, increased parity, smoking, cocaine. Um, patients can present with bleeding. Now the difference between placental abruption and percent, uh, placental previa is pain, right? Patients with placental abruption, it's painful. They can also get contractions and have uterine tenderness. So ultrasound is not sensitive for the diagnosis. So if you have a higher suspicion, you just you can't stop there. Um, fetal monitoring is important, depending on how far along you are. And sometimes this can be misdiagnosis preterm labor. Um, so the complication here is fetal and maternal death and DIC. And it's certainly, it can also be associated with painful dark red bleeding. So if somebody's complaining, that they have dark red bleeding coming in pregnancy, make sure to think about this. And then this picture here shows the difference between um, placental abruption, and you can see where you can have an internal bleeding, so you can see why you may not have vaginal bleeding, or it could be externally, in which case you would have pain and bleeding. Okay, so we talked about placental abruption, so let's talk about placenta previa. So this case is, again, painless red bleeding, um, as opposed to placental abruption, which is painful bleeding. So increased incidence here, again, older patients, multiparity, smoking, prior C-sections. So in this case, diagnosis is actually highly accurate, unlike with abruption where it's less accurate. And you know patients can bleed extensively here. So in those cases, you may need to activate your massive transfusion protocol. If you think that a patient has placental previa, do not do a pelvic exam. It is contraindicated. And then this next slide here is just showing you some examples of placenta previa. What about cardiac arrest in pregnancy? So most common causes here, trauma, PE, hemorrhage, right? If the uterus is at or above the umbilicus, remember that corresponds to about 20 weeks gestational age, you should manual displace it to the left, which reduces aortic cable compression and improves maternal circulation. Um, if you have greater than four minutes of cardiac arrest time and the fundus is above the umbilicus, that's an indication for perimortem C-section. Uh, you want to be out uh, by five minutes, right? You want to have the baby out by five minutes. Greater than 15 minutes, consider a thoracotomy. And the compressions and ventilations are basically the same as for non-pregnant patients. For cardiac arrest in pregnancy, think about an ET tube size that's a half to a centimeter smaller than the normal size because the airway narrows and becomes more friable in advanced pregnancy. If you have difficulty, here's a place where an LMA or another supraglottic airway might be a good rescue. Um, you should avoid hyperventilation if you can. This can cause placental vasoconstriction and hypoxia resulting in fetal acidosis. All the IV access should be above the diaphragm, right? Think of this as a traumatic interruption of the cava, and fetal monitoring is not recommended uh, you have other priorities. The fetus generally goes as the way of the mother, so you want to save mom's life here. Uh, you can consider thrombolysis, thrombolysis excuse me, for underlying PE and MI, and drugs and defibrillation are standard as with adult ACLS. Here's a kind of a flow, uh, flow sheet uh, for cardiac arrest and pregnancy, and this can be a good uh, reference slide, including some possible reversible contributing factors there at the bottom.